This is a Trinity Fellowship at Indiana University event. For more information about the Trinity Fellowship, please visit our website at tfiu.org. Thank you, Kyle. We appreciate that very much. We're going to have a, a little bit of time for some questions. And I um, understand we had a little technical difficulty to begin with, but I do have some questions. But before we go to questions, I want to introduce you to our panel. Uh, to my left is Rabbi Brian. Um, one of the reasons I want to introduce Rabbi Brian is because he's not only a religious colleague, he's a friend. Uh, Rabbi Brian and I have been working together for about two years. Our congregations at ECC and Congregation Beth Shalom to talk about these issues. Not everybody's interested in these conversations, but those who are have joined us. And we really had a delightful time. Uh, Brian is going to give a, a quick overview about something that I found to be profoundly helpful to me, a perspective that I didn't really have. He shared at one of our, our meetings where we were together. Also, we have uh, another guest with us, and uh, where is Brad Pontius? Brad, say hello. Yes. Uh, Brad is from Sherwood Oaks. Uh, he's an associate pastor over there. And his son um, is Joel Pontius. He is a professor at uh, Goshen College, assistant professor of sustainability and environmental education. Uh, he got his BS from IU, so he's okay. Uh, <laughs> he got an MS from uh, the University of I uh, from Wyoming and a PhD there as well. Um, so we're delighted to have him, and I'm gonna let both of them say a few words, but before they do, I wanted to mention something. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting, some of us from ECC and Congregation Beth Shalom. If you'd like to be a part of that, when you go out the back doors, there's a sign-up list to be on the email account for tfiu.org, but also a sign-up list that you can get involved uh, in that ongoing conversation. So, Brian, go right ahead. Share with us just for a moment. Is this on? Yes. Well, first of all, Kyle, thank you so much for your uh, impassioned and in informative talk. Uh, I want to say that I agree and validate with your translations of Avad and Shamar. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'd like to use some of your, uh, point, your theological points, particularly the ones related to the Old Testament. Uh, but I also enjoyed learning about some of the Christian theology. Um, what Pastor Bob asked me to talk about is um, a, a view of creation care from uh, uh, Jewish theology through the lens of Shabbat, through the lens of the Sabbath. Uh, and it's something that I mentioned off the cuff when we were at one of our earlier meetings. And I want to do this by reading a rather well-known brief quote from Abraham Joshua Hef Heschel, his uh, book called The Sabbath. And re uh, speaking about the Sabbath, he writes, the solution of humankind's most vexing problem will not be found in renouncing technical civilization, but in attaining some degree of independence of it. To set apart one day a week for freedom, a day on which we stop worshiping the idols of technical civilization, a day on which we use no money, a day of armistice in the economic struggle with our fellow human beings and the forces of nature, is there any institution that holds out a greater hope for our human progress than the Sabbath? So Heschel didn't make this up. He took this from Jewish tradition, which views the Sabbath uh, as the Talmud puts it, as a foretaste of the world to come. In other words, by living the Sabbath as, as it is meant to be lived, we get to live in the Messianic age here and now. I was really interested when Kyle was uh, mentioning a, a quote from uh, Revelations chapter 21, a depiction of the new Jerusalem and heaven coming down to earth, well, we Jews have that. We live that one day out of seven. We live the New Jerusalem, and that's, uh, that's on the Sabbath. Um, and uh, the, the purpose of it is that if we truly live as if we lived in a redeemed world one day out of seven, then we can go back during the work week, and we know what we're aiming for because we've experienced it. We've lived it. 
We've lived in a, uh, in a world which is completely at harmony with nature. Um, so I want to turn to the line that Heschel writes that I think is really um, apt for our discussion about climate change is when he talks about a day of armistice in the, in the struggle against the forces of nature. In other words, what, what Heschel is decrying is this sort of modern attitude that we're at war with nature, that we have to combat the forces of nature. And the vision of the Sabbath is quite the opposite. A lot of the Psalms, particularly Psalm 104 and, and others, depict a state of the world in which humankind is in balance with nature. Uh, that's the Sabbath vision. Um, speaking about the levees of New Orleans, and it was interesting to me that you uh, talked about that, uh, and also the, the bursting levees in, in Kenya, I happened to read an article yesterday about how Louisiana is sinking and losing um, 25 or 30 percent of its historic uh, land mass. And one of the points that the article made is that um, in order to combat the uh, flooding of the Mississippi, levees were constructed. But it causes a positive feedback loop because the more, the higher the levees are, that prevents the natural process of the silt being uh, deposited where the city is. Silt is no longer being deposited. It's all flowing out into the Gulf of Mexico. So that, over the long haul, is exacerbating the problem. It's a little bit like um, using an air conditioner to, uh, you know, to feel cool on summer days. You know, it's, it's exact, you know, in the long run, that's, that's a positive feedback loop. We all turn on air, air conditioners, that's just going to actually make it even warmer. So that's what Heschel is talking about when he's saying instead of viewing us in a battle against the forces of nature, which we cannot win, uh, rather, the Sabbath vision is to live in harmony with nature, and we suspend that. That's why um, Orthodox Jews are so insistent on not using money, not using technology, putting aside uh, all commerce and all concerns for, uh, for um, uh, monetary gain so that we can experience one day a week um, uh, um, uh, living in a redeemed world, living in the messianic age. But the Sabbath is more than, an e uh, than a time period or an epoch. It's actually a mindset. And in the Talmud, uh, the Sabbath is, is referred to as tachlit maaseh breshit, meaning the end goal of, uh, of creation. In other words, creation is tending for that the end purpose of why God created the world, and I loved how you spoke about the delight and joy of the creator for his creation, is, a, uh, uh, is the Sabbath world, a world redeemed, which is also, by the way, uh, the vision of, of, um, of, of the Garden of Eden. It just occurred to me for the first time, and I've thought a lot about that verse, to till and to, to tend, uh, from chapter 2 of Genesis, uh, what, I've, what I've never really appreciated, and it just sort of hit me when I was listening to you for the first time, is that uh, that uh, dafka, meaning that specifically takes place in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So this, which is the return, which is the renewal, the, I guess, mm -hmm. what was the Greek word, the kairos that you were, that you were talking about. Uh, a, a renewed world is, in Jewish tradition, uh, kind of like a return to the Garden of Eden, where we will have this um, this uh, uh, this harmonious relationship um, with nature. Um, so, in summary, and the main point that that uh, Bob wanted me to expound upon is that uh, the world will be redeemed when we live in um, in in the Sabbath every day. Mm -hmm. And we have a taste of that. We have a vision of that in the here and now. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. You can see why Brian and I enjoy talking to one another. 
Uh, we learn a lot from each other. Um, also, Joel Pontius is here, and Joel, I want you to just give a word about some of the things you do as a professor at Goshen College. Yeah, so I work in a place that maybe wants to be the Garden of Eden um, <laughs> that we're talking about. So I work on a 1,200-acre nature preserve called Mary Lee Environmental Learning Center. Um, Goshen College owns and operates that. Um, Goshen College is owned and operated by the Mennonite Church USA. Um, so in, on this preserve, we're experimenting with a lot of different things um, that are actually responding to climate change. Um, one of the things that we're experimenting with is uh, providing carbon sinks um, in different kind of novel ecosystems, especially in um, tall grass prairies. So prairies that grow um, just an incredible amount of biomass and an incredible amount of root mass. So, um, you know, a, a tall grass prairie would be like um, probably four feet over my head. <laughs> And then most of the biomass is actually would be under my feet. Mm -hmm. So about a third of the biomass is here, and then about two-thirds of it is below the earth in the roots. And it stores a lot of carbon. Um, that's just one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, so the preserve is, is operated under a Christian philosophy of earth keeping or earth care. Um, and I direct an immersion program on the preserve. It's called the Sustainability Leadership Semester. Um, it's mostly with undergraduate students, and they come to this place. Um, it's the, it was the first LEED Platinum certified uh, building project in the state of Indiana. So the students come, they live on a, um, in, a, in cottages that are run by um, solar panels. We have some solar thermal um, panels for hot water, um, and then also PV panels for electricity. A small scale wind turbine. Um, and then a lot of the um, systems kind of mirror these um, more biological systems. So um, our wastewater management is all through a constructed wetland. And then there's even a rainwater collection system. I mean, in the Great Lakes, we don't really need that. But um, there's a rainwater collection system where um, it captures the rainwater, and then we use that in um, flushing toilets, hoses, and stuff. And then there's, a, there's one shower that um, students can use that, that is um, cool water from, from the rainwater collection systems. So um, this sustainability leadership semester connects with uh, the watershed discipleship movement. Raise your hand if you've heard of that, watershed disciple. Oh, well, then I have to tell you about it. <laughs> Nobody. Um, so it's mostly a bunch of Mennonites in New Mexico. Mostly a bunch of Mennonites in New Mexico. Um, and it's basically um, taking the line of, you know, Jesus Christ, he was, you know, he's a, a Jewish mystic, and he got around walking, and he spent his whole life within this one, you know, small area. When he taught and got tired, he would go to the mountains, um, and he would pray. And praying happened in all different forms, um, et cetera, et cetera. So one of my friends, um, Todd Winward, he wrote a book about watershed discipleship. And he manages to get 75% of the things that he needs for his lifestyle, a simple lifestyle, from his bioregion around Taos, New Mexico. Um, so it's also along the lines of um, what uh, Christian environmental philosopher Wendell Berry wrote, and I quote, The question that must be addressed is not how to care for the planet, but how to care for each of the planet's millions of human and natural neighborhoods, each of its millions of small pieces and parcels of land, each one of which is in some precious way different from all the others. So with my students, um, I explore questions like, how do we become part of, contribute to, and grow movements that bring us closer to the creation and creator that is the source of health, life, and peace? How can we move towards social and environmental justice in our spiritual, professional, everyday, and community lives? What does it look like to engage deeply with work in restoration and renewal of creation that includes cities, rivers, farmland, forest? And what does this regenerative look like within ourselves and our relationships with our neighbors and even our enemies? And then also, um, how do we stay hopeful, realistic, and engaged in a time of global climate crisis? Um, what do we do about it? 
And, um, you know, how do we stay hopeful when there's a looming threat of nuclear war? Um, when we're living in a sea of plastics that we've created collectively and collectively have no idea what to do with. So I have the honor of working with students um, that take on, as we take on projects that mix kind of the spiritual, physical, emotional, and the creative, um, doing kind of, re, uh, we call it redemptive work. Um, so we found a dump in the middle of the woods, and um, we spent a lot of time moving a lot of material, and then we worked with a bunch of um, sculptors to create artwork out of some of the metal that couldn't be recycled, and we thought that was redeeming. Um, recently, we, um, we worked on an old uh, building foundation that was made of these uh, really, really beautiful old bricks. Um, they were on the edge of High Lake, the highest lake in the watershed, and we canoed out to this place, and we loaded up these canoes with bricks, and we couldn't get enough, so we went across the lake and unloaded them, and across the lake again and reloaded, and then we did that a couple more times. And then uh, we built a labyrinth um, but close to where the students live as a place for contemplative prayer. So just wanted to share those things. Um, I'm on again. Thank you very much. I could uh, sit here and listen to you guys for a long time. I had bragged before we started this event that I was going to quit, cut off all questions at 9 o'clock no matter what. <laughs> I was wrong. There's no way to do that because we haven't even addressed one question. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you that for the next 15 minutes, I promise that part, we're going to have a conversation. And if you want to leave before then, Nobody is going to judge you, okay? We're not <laughs> judging you if you want to leave before then. But uh, here we go. Here's some of your questions. We couldn't get them all in. Um, anybody can address these. Uh, sometimes you might want to avoid them. But anyway, here's, here's the first question that came through. Why is so much of the evangelical church fixated on spirituality while neglecting material and justice needs of people? Who wants to pick that one up? He's got a mic. That, that, that feels like it's directed at me. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't want to talk a lot during this time because I feel like I talked enough. Um, but just a word. I mean, this, this dualism of spiritual versus material is not biblical. It's Greek. Um, it's the influence of Greek philosophy on the, the Christian faith, and it's made its way um, through lots of years and, and lots of... Um, I would almost go so far as to call it syncretism, but I guess every religion it's impossible to avoid some sort of syncretism because we interact with culture all the time. Um, I, I, so this, this separation, I would say, is, is sub-biblical. It's not the teaching of Scripture, and it's frustrating to me that um, it's taken such a hold. Um, I think uh, there's also lots of kind of economic and cultural and political forces that benefit from a status quo that separates concerns like fair housing and economic justice and ecological justice from um, our faith and, and from, um, by separating the power of religion uh, from the power of social movements and the power uh, for the, the the search for justice. I think it's a, it's a way for the powers and principalities that Scripture t talks about to kind of divide and conquer. Um, so it's just a couple of thoughts, but I really I would love to hear um, others. Even though I'm the moderator, I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, first thing I want to say is it's not always been that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we think it has been, but it hasn't. So at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, you know who was doing the most social justice work in the United States? Even the church. And it was primarily Methodists that were coming out and forming things like the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. um, we were at the cutting edge at one point in issues related to social justice. Also the church, let's roll back the clock to the first century was dramatically involved in social justice issues. They were picking up children who were abandoned on the streets of the cities in the Roman Empire and taking them in and raising them as their own. 
They were reaching out to the poor and the disenfranchised. That's what Christians were always known for. Whether or not we're known for that now is a good question. Whether or not we should be known for that now, absolutely. We ought to be people of social justice and reaching out to everybody who's disenfranchised. There's no reason why we can't redeem that identity as the Church of Jesus Christ. That's all I got to say. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of questions that relate to what can I do to make a difference, right? Simple things that I can do to make a difference. I'm going to skip over those for a minute because you gave a bunch of things and you also have a great handout out there, okay? And I'll go to uh, a couple of other things. Um, one is an interesting question. Um, I don't suppose Brian will want to answer this. Maybe so, Brian. I don't know. You have a Jewish perspective on Revelation, too. Um, why does the book of Revelation, particularly chapters 21 through 22, talk about a city and not a garden? <laughs> if the tending of the natural world is so important, why use that image? Who wants to take it up? He, oh, go ahead. You need a mic. <laughs> My knowledge of Revelations chapter 21 is basically what I heard tonight. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but I, I myself elided uh, the, the imagery of the New Jerusalem with the Garden of Eden. So uh, um, I guess that's all I'll say. <laughs> you wanna... He's got a mic. Yeah, um, so I, I think it has to do with human agency and the dignity given to uh, human culture and capacity for culture making. So there's a great book called Culture Making by Andy Crouch. I'd highly recommend. And he talks about this. He says, why does the story start in a garden and end in a city? Uh, and the case that he makes that I find compelling is that a city is nature plus culture. Um, so it's, it's nature, it's God's creative work joined with human's own capacity for creative work, which is also the image of God in us. It's our participation with God harmoniously in the work of cultivating creation. Um, so I, I tend to like that explanation. Um, that, that, can I turn this off? <laughs> no, you shouldn't have been able to okay. try, keep trying. Is this projecting? No. Okay. Um, actually, when you were talking earlier, uh, and you said that um, the, the idea of God coming down to earth, and that was really central to uh, the end of the story in Revelations, that God comes to us, we don't go up to God, mm -hmm. reminds me of the passage in Exodus where, it's, uh, where the first sanctuary is built. And the verse says that, uh, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, the, that God's creative and redemptive um, power works through uh, human beings uh, is consistent with uh, something that I failed to mention earlier, which is that um, a, a strong facet of uh, the Jewish theology of creation is that creation was purposely left incomplete at the end of the sixth day so that human beings could become co-creators for its completion. We got this mic working, so I'm going to say something. Um, I don't think multiple images necessarily means contradiction, right? So the image of a garden and the image of a city don't necessarily have to be in opposition to one another. They may actually expand the picture. Furthermore, when we think of a city now, what do we think of? Asphalt jungles, mm -hmm. carbon pollution, all kinds of things like that. First century cities didn't look quite that way. And certainly even more ancient cities didn't look quite that way. Um, agriculture was even a part of the city. And if it wasn't a part of the city, it was on the edge of the city. And there was no such thing as grocery stores. Um, uh, the urban and the... Uh, the environment of the uh, field and the city was not that much different as it is now. So that's what I know. And it wasn't just any city. It's Jerusalem. That's and right. Jerusalem is the city uh, that, you know, embodies peace and harmony. Yep. 
So let me throw out a controversial one, especially for people who are on one side or the other of the political spectrum. Uh, this question says, how can Christians reconcile concerns about climate change and pro-life beliefs when voting in an election? Kyle, why don't you pick that one up? Can I put you on the spot? You do a lot of political advocacy. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what we do is talk about climate change as a pro-life issue. Um, we talk about things like the way that uh, fossil fuel pollution harms the unborn and fetal development. We talk about um, the way that it harms young kids and vulnerable people like the elderly and the disabled. Part of what we need to do collectively is uh, create a scenario in which we don't face that conflict at the ballot box anymore, right? In 2020, we might not be able to vote for a candidate who is strongly anti-abortion and strongly in favor of bold climate action. That's our current political reality. But the work of political advocacy is changing political realities. And as the people of God, I think it's part of our job to work to change that political reality so that there will come a day when it's not a contradiction in terms to be pro-life and pro-climate action. Um, so I guess my answer is, for now, um, it's hard to reconcile those two things, unfortunately, but it shouldn't be, and it doesn't have to be. So let's work uh, to change that. So staying on the political theme, uh, how do we communicate the climate change in a way that's not a partisan issue? How do we do that? How do we uh, remain friends, so to speak, without being polarized by politics and discuss this topic? So this is a really interesting um, topic because climate change isn't a political issue in any country in the world except for the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also have a problem in the United States of having no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. So these are related things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say. Um, but one, one of the things, um, you know, climate change uh, a, as a topic, it's really interesting that it becomes a political issue because, be, you know, sort of, believing in climate change, what does that gain a person? Um, so it's really interesting. Um, I think that one of the ways that we can do a good job of communicating about this issue is to bring up stories like Kyle did. Um, there was a group of people um, in the Mennonite church called the Global South Voices. And um, the Mennonite Creation Care um, group that's run out of the Nature Center that I work at um, they funded partly this, this group that went around the country and told their individual stories of being in the global south and um, seeing the impacts of climate change. So, so I think that's one way, um, is just to kind of like do a little bit of digging um, to, uh, you know, there are all kinds of amazing videos um, on YouTube of these climate events that are really insane. Um, and also, I think it's really, um, like, who feels like they really understand the weather and how it works? <laughs> we could all stand to do a little bit of digging. Um, and, you know, I think that um, the weather is always fascinating. We can literally predict what the weather will be like two days from now if we understand how to read clouds. We can still do that. We can learn how to do that. Um, and just getting into these kind of patterns and rhythms um, and asking these kinds of questions with other people that we might not see eye to eye with, um, I think that can, can lead to some change and interesting conversations. Okay, I got a time for a couple more depending on how long our answers are. Um, here's an in interesting question, I chuckle. Is recycling still a viable solution now that China is no longer accepting our recycling. I have no idea how to address that. Does anybody else want to? So yes, it is. Um, one, one of the, there are several countries that do a really great job of recycling. Norway has a world-class recycling system, so does Sweden. Um, we, we have the capacity to do that. 
but we'll have to do lots of work to create markets for recycling. So where there's no market for recyclables, then um, the whole China's, I mean, the idea of sending our recyclables across the world, it, it, I mean, from the first place is just pretty insane. <laughs> um, but, but if we can create markets, um, there are all kinds of um, like sustainability related jobs um, that, are, that are starting up um, in the United States. And if we can create that, maybe, maybe we have a, a shot at a good recycling system. Okay. This one actually is directed to you, Joel. I'm sorry. Uh, this is the third question for you. Um, how does peacemaking relate to the topic of chi climate change? You're in a Mennonite context. Peacemaking is huge. Uh, climate change is important to you. How do they integrate? Well, I have lots of friends who could an answer that question much better than, than I can. Um, but how do, the question is, how does peacemaking and action on climate change? How, do, how does peacemaking relate to the topic of climate change? Um, I think there are a lot of different ways. I mean, the climate crisis is going to cause all kinds of um, migrations, you know, across the whole world. We're already seeing that. Um, my wife is an immigration attorney, and she um, has been looking into what, what climate-based migration is looking like. Um, so that's one of the ways. I mean, um, when, uh, yeah, I think we have, we have a lot of, um, there are a lot of complex pieces of that. I, I'm going to stop before I say something that's, that's going to be um, ridiculous. <laughs> um, in Hebrew, the word for war, milchama, comes from the word lechem, which means bread. And that speaks to a, the, the linguistic um, factoid speaks to a truth that, that wars start over, many wars start over a fight for resources. So need I say more? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Well, that's the end of our time. Um, I promise you we get out of here at 9.15. I'm going to keep my promise. But here's the next thing to say. I guarantee you all of these gentlemen up here are willing to talk to you as long as you want. Isn't that right? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> They're willing to talk to you for a while, so you can ask some questions. Uh, Kyle's sleeping at my house, so he knows where he's going. It's a nice bed. You'll be okay. Um, but um, if you'd like to ask some more questions, feel free to do so. And thank him for being here, will you? listening to this Trinity Fellowship at Indiana University event. For more information about the Trinity Fellowship, please visit our website at tfiu.org.